Good evening. I'm David Ferriero, the Archivist of the United States, and it's a pleasure to welcome you this evening to the William G. McGowan Theater here at the National Archives. And we're pleased you could join us here tonight, whether you're here in the theater or joining us on our YouTube channel. I want to thank our partners, the Constitutional Accountability Center and the National Park Service for tonight's program, the 14th Amendment, the National Park Service and America's second founding. This year, we marked the 150th anniversary of the House Joint Resolution proposing the 14th Amendment in June 1866. It was ratified two years later, and since then, this amendment has redefined American citizenship and changed the relationship between the states and the federal government. Before we go any further, I'd like to tell you about two programs coming up next month here in this theater. At 7 p.m. next Tuesday, October 4th, we'll show the documentary film Equal Means Equal, which looks at how women are treated in the United States today. A discussion with the film's director, Kamala Lopez, will, fo will follow the screening. Two weeks later, on Wednesday, October 19th at 7, we look back at the Black Power Movement at the 50th anniversary of its founding. Panelists will discuss revolutionary movements then and now, Black Power and Black Lives Matter. To learn more about these and all of our public programs and exhibits, consult our monthly calendar of events. There are copies in the lobby as well as a sign-up sheet where you can receive it in regular mail or by email. You'll also find brochures about other National Archives activities. And another way to get more involved with the National Archives is to become a member of the National Archives Foundation. The foundation supports all of our outreach programs. There are applications in the lobby, or you can become a member online at archivesfoundation.gov.org. Upstairs in the David M. Rubenstein Gallery, the permanent exhibit called Records of Rights, uses archival documents to examine the struggles of Americans to define and realize their civil rights. Close by the 1297 Magna Carta is the landmark document case, which we use to temporarily display some of our most important rights records. In the months leading up to the gallery's open, opening in December of 2013, we asked the public to vote for the first document to display in their case, and their unanimous choice was the 14th Amendment. It was appropriate for that amendment to be the inaugural landmark document because it defines citizenship, citizenship mandates federal product, protection of due process, and protects the life, liberty, and property of all citizens equally. And today, the 14th Amendment is one of the featured documents in Amending America, our newest exhibit in the Lawrence O'Brien Gallery. I hope you'll have an opportunity to view this document while visiting our museum in the near future. The provisions of the 14th Amendment are the means through which Americans claim protection for their rights, and the records of the struggles for those rights are here in the National Archives. We preserve them for you and for the generations to follow. Our moderator tonight is Elizabeth Widra. She's the president of the Constitutional Accountability Center. And from 2008 to 2016, she served as the center's chief counsel. A graduate of Claremont McKenna College and Yale Law School, Widra was in private practice at Quinn Emanuel Urquhart and Sullivan in San Francisco before joining the center. She has represented the center as well as clients, including congressional leaders, preeminent constitutional scholars and historians, state and local legislators, and government organizations. She appears frequently in print and on air as a legal expert. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Elizabeth Wydra. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much, Mr. Ferriero, for that lovely opening and for the National Archives being willing to open its doors to us here tonight for this program. It is fitting that we are in this building that houses our Constitution, the document that ushered in a new era of democracy that changed modern human history when it was drafted in 1787. This document, ordained and established by we the people, represents our nation's founding. But that other charter of freedom that is represented in the rotunda, the Declaration of Independence, which set forth our founding ideals of equality and liberty for all, that was not truly written into our Constitution 
as it stood in 1787. Before the Civil War, the Constitution tolerated slavery. And perhaps even worse, various provisions, including the Three-Fifths Clause and the Fugitive Slave Clause, empowered southern slave states, increasing their political power throughout the pre-Civil War period. The Constitution, indeed, was silent on the Declaration's promise of equality for all. Indeed, how could such a promise square with human slavery? And it was silent, indeed, on the issue of voting rights and citizenship and true equality. Before the Civil War, states could violate key fundamental liberties, such as those set out in the Bill of Rights, including free speech, with impunity, and they did. They punished, in many states, abolitionist language by punishment of death. And citizenship rights were left up to the states. And so we came before the Civil War to the Supreme Court with Chief Justice Taney infamously declaring in the Dred Scott case that African Americans were not citizens and indeed had no rights which the white man was bound to respect. So while the American people rightly revere George Washington, James Madison, and our other founding fathers, it really took the heroic efforts of President Lincoln, Thaddeus Stevens, Frederick Douglass, John Bingham, the drafter of the 14th Amendment, to really make our country the more perfect union that we now live in, winning a bloody civil war and ratifying a series of amendments that removed the stain of slavery from our founding constitution, protected fundamental rights from state abuses, guaranteed equality for all, expanded the right to vote, and set in the Constitution that if you are born on US soil, whether your father was a senator or a slave, whether your parents immigrated yesterday or came over on the Mayflower, if you are born here, you are born equal and an equal citizen. We refer to these post-Civil War amendments, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, as our nation's second founding. The Constitutional Accountability Center, as Mr. Ferriero mentioned, is celebrating the sesquicentennial of these amendments through the Second Founding Project in partnership with our great friends in Philadelphia at the National Constitution Center. And tonight's program, in partnership with the National Park Service, is part of this Second Founding Project. We seek to put the spotlight on these amendments because Americans are not as well versed in the amended Constitution as they are in the Constitution of 1787. But we should pay just as much attention to the amended Constitution because while the 1787 framers succeeded in creating the most enduring form of democracy that this planet has ever seen, it was not until the second founding that the Constitution began to emerge as the inspiring document that we see today. Unfortunately, even the second founding story is one of promise and betrayal. During what historians call the Reconstruction Era, under the new constitutional amendments guarantees of equality and citizenship, there was a flourishing of black political power and economic and educational advancement aided by programs set forth by new government agencies like the Freedmen's Bureau. But these majestic declarations of equal citizenship and guarantees of liberty in the Reconstruction Amendments were soon to be silenced by state-sanctioned racial violence and intimidation, by a Supreme Court sympathetic to Southern slave power and institutions and eager to thwart the progress of the Reconstruction Amendments and ultimately racist Jim Crow laws that prevented African Americans from experiencing the freedom and equality that was hard won in the Civil War and justly guaranteed in the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. Indeed, it took the courage of the Civil Rights Movement and leaders like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. to make real the promises of the Second Founding and laws like the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965 to make these guarantees enforceable and real for many Americans across the country. But the history of what happened after these amendments were passed, this Reconstruction Era, is not very well known. And that is where tonight's program comes in, to talk about why that history is not so well known and what can be done to tell that Reconstruction story more effectively and how to place its relevance in important conversations today about the direction of the country and who we are as Americans. Helping us to navigate this path tonight, we are joined by Michael Allen and Dr. Jukai Lowe of the National Park Service and Professor Kate Mazur of Northwestern University. But before we start this panel discussion, 
and the role the National Park Service can play in it in terms of reconstruction history. We are so honored, so deeply honored to have Congressman James Clyburn of South Carolina give our keynote address. Now, he really needs no introduction, and I could go on and on and on about the many wonderful things Congressman Clyburn has done in his life and career, but because I know we are all eager to hear him speak, I will be brief. The Congressman was elected to represent South Carolina in 1993, the state's first African-American member of the House since Reconstruction, and his career in Congress since then has been unquestionably distinguished. As none other than President Barack Obama has said, he's one of a handful of people who, when they speak, the entire Congress listens. As Assistant Democratic Leader in the 114th Congress, the number three Democrat in the House, Representative Clyburn is the leadership liaison to the Appropriations Committee, one of the Democratic Caucus's primary liaisons to the White House, and chair of the recently formed Democratic, House Democrats Democratic Outreach and Engagement Task Force. He has also, very relevant tonight, been a leader in working to ensure that our nation's rich and complex history is better understood and honored. He authored legislation that established the Gullah Geechee Cultur Cultural Heritage Corridor, which recognizes the important cultural contributions um, and historical contributions of the Gullah and Geechee communities that stretch from the coast of Florida all the way up through North Carolina. And he recently proposed legislation to create a national monument dedicated to the Reconstruction era at Penn Center in St. Helena Island, South Carolina. The Penn Center being one of the first schools established in the Southern United States to educate African American students in the wake of the Civil War and help local black communities thrive with the educational and opportun economic opportunities that they had been denied previously during slavery. We are very honored that he is here to speak with us this evening. Please join me in welcoming Congressman Clyburn. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, and thank you so much for being so kind uh, to invite me to spend a few moments with you. Now, uh, you've got a panel uh, that's going to get into the weeds, uh, as we often say. Uh, over on the floor of the House. Uh, I, I'm going to stay a little bit above that uh, tonight and to really talk to you a little bit about the 14th Amendment as a living document. Now, uh, I think, where's Perello? Congressman Perello, uh, my former colleague who has now uh, found a better life uh, outside of Congress from Virginia. Thank you so much for uh, not being ashamed to be seen with me this evening. Um, in fact, I didn't say anything to him uh, earlier, but I read a piece not long ago. Uh, Perella told the writer that um, uh, the one person he didn't want to get a phone call from when he was in the Congress was me. I thought I was a nice guy. Uh, but he says, uh, he could accept phone calls from everybody in the leadership except the one coming from me. Um, but I really appreciate him and thank him so much for the work he's doing in the Congo and other places for, for the president today. I uh, was born and raised uh, in South Carolina. I often uh, have to have extended discussions with people who, for some strange reason, feel that my attitude toward that history uh, is strange. Um, I, I, I love history. I started, uh, when I was growing up, my, or even before I started growing up, my dad had two rules. He had a lot of rules, but there were two rules in our house that was a particular, uh, that had a particular impact on me. One was, Every morning at the breakfast table, we were required uh, to recite a Bible verse before lifting the fork. Um, and you couldn't say the same one twice. And on the day he laid down the rule, he took Jesus' whip off the table. <laughs> Every evening before going to bed, we were required to share with him and my mother some, or my mother, or both, sometimes both, a current event. Um, we didn't have television. Um, 
The newspaper was delivered to the house every afternoon, but that every evening we had to share a current event. Now, you could not recite Bible verses without reading the Bible. You could not share a current event without reading that newspaper. And so I grew up with that. Uh, and so uh, when I went away to school, to college, I, well, I went away to high school. Uh, I'm a graduate of uh, Mather Academy, uh, which was a school in Camden, South Carolina. There are two Mathers, one in, well, were two Mathers, one in Camden, the other in Beaufort, right across the river from uh, Penn uh, Community Center, St. Helena Island. Uh, those two schools were established by the Mather family who came south uh, and found schools uh, to educate blacks, much as Penn Community Center was. Penn Community Center was the first one. My mother went to that school, uh, and um, uh, that school was a Methodist school. And we were drilled. The Bible was a subject just like English and history. And so the Bible became a history book to me. And it still is to this day. I decided, though, that I was not going to follow my father in the ministry. Uh, and uh, But I really felt that if we were going to have a, if we are going to have a country uh, worth living in, we must get a better understanding and respect for our history. And I've dedicated all my service in the Congress to that. Many of you have heard uh, George Santayana, though that there are a lot of variations to if we fail to learn the lessons of our history, we're bound uh, to repeat them. Uh, I, I, I recite that often in trying to get my colleagues in the Congress uh, to really make decisions in creating legislation that would allow us to get beyond that history. And the only way I think for us to do that is for us to really spend a little time trying to understand it, and you can't understand it until you at first learn it. And so that is what I'm dedicated to. Now, the 14th Amendment is an interesting document, but like every other uh, constitutional amendment, it only means what the Supreme Court says it means. Uh, uh, the Supreme Court made a decision. Now, the 14th Amendment was, was ratified in 1868, as you just heard, having passed the Congress in 1866. Uh, at the same time that the Supreme Court was ratifying uh, the 14th Amendment, South Carolina was holding a constitutional convention uh, to lay out uh, rules, regulations, procedures for uh, the whole state taking into account uh, the newly freed slaves. Now, uh, the problem is that, and this is, you find this throughout history. Every time the Congress moves left in the political sense, the Supreme Court moves to the right. Just check it, and you're going to find that uh, people don't usually categorize it that way, but that's, that's true. This, uh, the Congress in 1866 uh, went way left with the 14th Amendment. But the Supreme Court in 1876, in this Khrushchev decision out of Louisiana, went way right. Well, in 1896, 
the Supreme Court found a way in, in Plessy uh, to allow the 14th Amendment to, to uh, tolerate, I should say, separate but equal. Now, when the Supreme Court goes left, as it did in 1954, you will find that the Congress will find a way to go right. All you got to do is look at Strom Thurmond. A lot of people think it was 1964. Strom Thurmond uh, set the record for filibustering in 1957. It was the 1957 Civil Rights Act uh, that Thurmond was filibustering, which was only establishment or the expression of a principle. Uh, and uh, it was because the Supreme Court had gone left in 54 and the Congress started looking for ways to go to the right as, as some sort of a check. Now, in 64, 65, 68, 72, uh, I'm amazed at the number of people I run into who uh, tend to, uh, to, to take all of the stuff that happened uh, over that eight-year period from 1964 to, uh, eight, 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 I mean, from 1964 to 1972, and interpret that as one civil rights act. No, there were four different civil rights acts. When the civil rights act passed in 1964, it didn't apply to the, to, to the public sector. It only applied to the private sector. In 1964, after the civil rights act passed, uh, it was still legal for South Carolina and all other states to discriminate in hiring. And they did very forcefully. Uh, that was not outlawed until 1972. Uh, many of us remember uh, Lyndon Johnson's famous admonition that a half loaf is better than no loaf at all. That came about because the, the, the civil rights community did not want to accept the 64 Civil Rights Act without voting. But Johnson knew he was not going to get voting done. Uh, and um, uh, I don't know how many of you have seen it. I, I went up to New York to see the play uh, all the way, uh, which I thought was a magnificent uh, uh, production. Uh, I, I, I really am very anxious to see Hamilton. Uh, except that uh, you, I, I, a congressional salary would not allow uh, $700 for a ticket. Uh, and so I have not seen Hamilton yet. Uh, but if you look at all of this, uh, we have to come to a conclusion now. Uh, Craig is Link, uh, who I asked to do a little research for tonight, I came across a, a quote which um, I want to share with you. Uh, uh, Thomas Paine uh, uh, was one of my, uh, I've studied uh, Thomas Paine, and you know, these are times to try men's souls, summer soldiers and sunshine patriots, willing to Christ and strengthen the service of their country. All that stuff I learned early. But Craig found a quote that I want to share with you, a Thomas Paine quote. It's quite frankly, if I ever knew it, I'd forgotten it. Uh, and it's this, those who expect to reap the blessings of freedom must, like men, undergo the fatigue of supporting it. Those who wish to enjoy the blessings of freedom must undergo the fatigue of supporting it. Now, the problem we have in our society today and the problem we have with those who uh, continue to fight these battles is that we do not wish to tire in support of freedom. Now, I've never been able to find this to be the case, but often we give Thomas Jefferson the credit of, of saying that uh, 
the price of freedom is eternal vigilance. Now, a lot of people give him credit for that. All those people from Virginia, I'm sure they do. <laughs> Tom Perrello. But I've been researching that, and I cannot find <laughs> that Thomas Jefferson never said that. But I also write if they want to give him credit, it's all right with me. It's a good statement, whoever came up with it. But you know, if we oversimplify these approaches with these kinds of statements, uh, I, I think it was, uh, though he was not the original, uh, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. often talk about the, uh, uh, the arc of the universe being long, but bending toward freedom. A lot of people give him credit for that, but uh, I've looked that up too. Uh, that was out there a long time before he was born. Uh, but he popularized it, and that's fine. But the problem with oversimplifying that is the fact that we tend to feel that our country, or even the world, moves on some kind of a linear plane. And it doesn't. The country doesn't move from point A to point B to point C, and if not, the country moves like a pendulum on the clock going left and back right and back left again. That is the way it has been. You consult your history books and you will see that this country is always going left to right. And the only thing that stops the sway is intervention of the voters. Now, I have some very interesting, and I'm going to thank Craig for doing the real good research here. He's going to be upset with me for not using it. But that's all. But I wrote in my memoirs that Nathan uh, just asked me to sign for him. I hope he stayed around. Uh, I, I was pleased to do that. Um, the premise of my memoirs, and I'm going to close with this. When my dad uh, and I had discussions about me following him into the ministry. That was my intention until I was getting out of jail for about the third time. Uh, and I figured that wasn't working too well. But when I went home, <clears throat> and someone told me I should always close the loop on that. This was during the sit-ins of the sixes. Uh, so I didn't go to jail for <laughs> robbing it and hijacking it. And <laughs> But it, it worked pretty good for me. I met my wife in jail. Uh, yeah. And it's lasted for 55 years. Um, but when I went home to tell my dad that I had changed my mind and I did not think I was going to go to the seminary, he told me one day, well, Cindy said, I suspect the world would much rather see a sermon than to hear one. And I've used that as sort of a mantra. And when I started writing my memoirs, uh, which was published two years ago. And by the way, the readers of, 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 of Amazon gives it five stars. <laughs> so I got, I just started experiencing what everybody called writer's block, which I thought was a joke. Um, and when I got laid off that book almost a year, I, I remembered my dad used to prepare for his his sermons every week by taking his last meal of the week around 6 o'clock on Friday. And he would not eat again until after church on Sunday. He would spend all day Saturdays reading, writing, and he would be walking through the house humming his favorite hymn, Blessed Assurance. And so I got that hymn and started reading it, trying to figure out whether or not it would do for me what it did for my dad. And it did. So I changed the title of my book to Blessed Experiences. And the premise of the whole book is we can be no more, nor will we ever be any less and what our experiences allow us to be. 
no matter what it is you may think you are, if you do not have appropriate experiences in life, uh, you will be limited to whatever your experiences might be. And so that's why I believe strongly uh, that we ought to always spend as much time as we possibly can understanding our tortures history and being strong enough to celebrate it, study it and celebrate it. It doesn't mean that you celebrate every condition it means that you celebrate who and what we are that result from those experiences. But in order to do that, we have to learn to respect the experiences. My wife grew up on a little 22-acre farm in Berkeley County, South Carolina. She used to walk to school two and a half miles every morning and back home two and a half miles every afternoon. She never learned to ride a bicycle. There wasn't a paved road anywhere near there. I grew up in the town of Sumter on a paved street. If we didn't get a pair of skates for Christmas, no matter what we got, everybody had to have a pair of skates. You were, you were not in if you didn't have skates. My elementary school was three blocks from my house. My middle school was six blocks from my house. And my dormitory at Mather Academy was about 20 steps from my academic building. And so when I spoke out after the Judge McMillan's decision in the um, Swan v. Mecklenburg. I spoke out against that decision because I thought it put too much burden on the students. And I was before the TV camera waxing eloquently, I thought, until I got home that evening. And when I walked into my house that evening, my wife was standing in the middle of the floor, tears streaming down her face. And I ran to her, thinking something may have been wrong with our daughter, Mignon, who was the only child we had at the time. I said, what is wrong? Is something wrong with Mignon? She said, no, there's nothing wrong with Mignon. I just saw you on television. There's something wrong with you. <laughs> and she told me about this experience that she had. I didn't know what it was to walk two and a half miles to school in the morning. And she told me on that day, they were not against busing then, and you bet not be against busing now. I learned on that day that our experiences were different, and that if we were going to have any success in our marriage, I had to make some adjustments. <laughs> and I made them. And I believe that that same principle needs to apply to each and every one of us as we care about our duties and responsibilities today. We have to learn that we are but the sum total of our experiences. And until we learn how to respect the experiences of others, uh, we are going to have torturous relationships. Black lives do matter. All lives do matter. We must learn to respect all lives and all experiences. And the 14th Amendment will be a living document. Thank you so much.
Thank you so much, Congressman Clyburn, for those wonderful remarks. I think that we, um, you know, that we're, we're left to our task of the panel discussion with, I think, some great points to start with. One, always listen to your wife. I think that's what we got from that. Um, uh, two, two, and perhaps more relevant to tonight, that we need to understand, respect, honor our history, and use that history to think about people's experiences today and learn from that as a country. So I'm delighted to have this panel with us tonight to talk more about the 14th Amendment, Reconstruction, uh, and the National Park Service, how we can tell that story even better and have it better understood, uh, better understand the history as Congressman Clyburn just urged us to do. Um, so we, have, we uh, have fuller biographies in the programs. So I will just keep very brief with our esteemed panel um, so we can get right to the con con conversation. Um, we have Michael Allen, who is the Community Partnership Specialist with the Southeast Regional Office of the National Park Service. Uh, he is a member of the National Park Service Cultural Resources Advisory Board, and very relevant to tonight's conversation, he heads the National Park Service's National Historic Landmark Theme Study on the Reconstruction Era, which um, uh, everyone on this panel is working on, um, but he uh, is taking the lead on that. Thank you so much. And uh, in uh, uh, speaking of Congressman Clyburn, Mr. Allen worked with him on the creation of the Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage Corridor, and he um, uh, continues to be involved with that. So thank you so much for being with us. Uh, next to Mr. Allen is Dr. Drakaya Lowe, who is Southeast Region Chief Historian and Community Planning Specialist for the National Park Service. She uh, works on issues that focus on African American history, 20th century US history, and women's history. Uh, she is a graduate of Howard University, so hooray for the DC area. Um, and uh, the University of Washington as well, and is originally from Savannah, Georgia. Thank you for being with us. And finally, we have Dr. Kate Mazur, who is Professor of History and Faculty Affiliate of the Department of African American Studies at Northwestern University. Uh, she is the author of An Example for All the Land, Emancipation and the Struggle Over Equality in Washington, DC. And uh, very relevant to tonight's conversation, we'll be talking much more about this. She is a co-author on the National Park Service publication uh, titled A National Historic Landmark Theme Study on Reconstruction. And she was a member of the editorial team for the Park Service publication Reconstruction, the official National Park Service Handbook. So we have got the people with us tonight who know about Reconstruction. Um, and I want to start off exactly with that question because I think that, um, you know, People uh, have heard of the 14th Amendment. Uh, they may have heard of the second founding. They may have heard of Reconstruction, but there are a lot, there's a lot of, um, uh, I think, misrepresentation or misunderstanding of the Reconstruction era. So just so we can get the basics, um, Dr. Lowe, do you mind giving us a thumbnail sketch of what we mean when we talk about Reconstruction? Okay. Um, well, uh, I talk about, or the National Park Service also talks about uh, the Reconstruction era um, is what we've term, termed it. But Reconstruction is both a period of history as well as a program, a program that uh, is, um, is, is our historical program for moving four million formerly enslaved uh, African Americans from their uh, identity as property to citizens of this country. So we in the Park Service de, de, uh, define the Reconstruction era as beginning with the Civil War, um, with the first shots fired over Fort Sumter and all of the events that um, preceded. We are looking officially at the ending of Reconstruction or the transformation of Reconstruction uh, to the 19, 1898 era. Um, some of you in your history classes, I hope, uh, some of you have had uh, uh, classes that termed Reconstruction as beginning in 1865 to 1877, and that talks mainly about the program of Reconstruction, um, which the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments and uh, passage are part of. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And you mentioned uh, what we might have learned in history class. Mm -hmm. and. Um, that itself opens up a big can of worms because the Reconstruction era um, 
I think perhaps most infamously or um, of any of our American historical periods, I think has been uh, uh, profoundly misrepresented. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of that was intentional. Um, and we have you know, some great historians here tonight to set the record straight on that. And, um, but I think it's interesting and indeed very illustrative of some of the problems that Reconstruction ran into to just even talk about why it was misrepresented in the first place. So Professor Mazur, do you mind giving us kind of a sketch of, of how that kind of misrepresentation of history happened and why we're fighting so hard now to have modern historians like all of you set the record straight? Sure, um, thank you. I, uh, I think it, it, there's a generational thing in how people understand Reconstruction, how they come at it. And I think people, without putting a year on it, I'm sure that it wouldn't be possible to exactly put a year where this changed over, but I think people who are relatively older, let's say, um, may well have learned from textbooks that have um, a kind of older interpretation, which I'm about to describe, whereas younger people, and we can talk about this too, have a different version in their head. And so I, I want to just start by saying that we, we can't assume that everyone has the same kind of wrong interpretation of Reconstruction or misinterpretation, because actually a lot of people have actually very little idea of Reconstruction whatsoever, much less a misperception of it. Now, what happened, uh, you know, kind of a general overview is um, immediately during Reconstruction even, um, when a lot of white Southerners were so outraged both by uh, federal policies themselves and by um, the empowerment basically of African Americans or the very fact of emancipation itself, um, began to write. Obviously, one of the ways they resisted was by writing against what was going on, by talking about um, how unfair this federal policy was, how, in fact, it was upsetting what they considered to be the natural racial order of the South. So their interpretation was very grounded in an idea about race and racial order, which put white people on top, that many people believe that was the natural order of things. Um, and that interpretation, which in some ways was originally a political point of view, it was, a par it was an effort to overthrow Reconstruction, to discredit it as a policy, mm -hmm. um, eventually became the prevailing view, including even among professional historians, who then um, were some of the pioneers in kind of creating a, a historical literature um, on Reconstruction that had, I would say, you know, kind of two main premises. One, that this experiment in federal policymaking from including the Reconstruction Amendments um, and uh, legislation coming from Washington like the uh, Reconstruction Act of 1867 or the Enforcement Acts of 1870 and 1871 was all um, virtually unconstitutional, certainly unjust to the white South. That sort of point number one has to do with federal power and point number two has to do with empowerment of African Americans, the idea that this was not the natural way things should be and the sum of those two things was leave white Southerners to have control over their space. And this whole experiment that we're talking about of Reconstruction was a dramatic failure, they argued. Mm -hmm. And so we see that coming into mainstream academic interpretations of Reconstruction. That's how it finds its way into textbooks. It's in popular culture. It's in films like Birth of a Nation. It's in Gone with the Wind. It's also arguably still in our culture and still in some aspects of our popular culture. And I, I think we've seen a few uh, examples of that where it kind of s continues to sneak in. Mm -hmm. um, so on the other hand, right, um, going way back was an, a countervailing interpretation from uh, African-American scholars, sometimes from white scholars on the left, um, who said, you know what, this is actually wrong. It's literally propaganda. That's not how it happened. You're ignoring important voices. Um, I guess I should add, the prevailing kind of view um, also coincided with the rise of Jim Crow, right? So this view came into vogue, it came into popular uh, kind of acceptance at, as part of the apparatus of Jim Crow because it justified the Jim Crow order. So increasingly with the civil rights era, people began to take another look <coughs> at that history and to say, wait a minute, like this is actually has more to do with kind of a, a political argument, an ideological argument than what actually transpired if we come at this from a perspective that doesn't assume white supremacy, uh, that doesn't assume that uh, this was automatically the wrong set of things to have tried to do after emancipation, things look quite different. So the reality is that um, for many decades, for uh, four or five decades at least, historians have been rewriting the history of Reconstruction and 
But yet, so many people still, if they went to school, you know, a few decades ago, would have learned the old version. It doesn't really matter that much where you went to school. I found that Northerners and Southerners, Westerners, this was just in the textbook. So, um, and that has gradually been replaced. But then the question becomes, okay, uh, who's really learning this history anyway? So, so there's a lot of complexities. I don't want to go on too long, but I could kind of follow up on that too. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And I think you know because even now there has been that kind of uh, you know a, a muddle of the history. Then people just fast forward to the civil rights movement, and it's sort of like, well, we'll go from there to things were bad, civil rights movement, um, and. But doing that helps, you know, doesn't help us understand how we got to the 20th century civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. And I think the root of a lot of the, um, you know, a lot of the problems that we're still talking about today. Um, but it really gets to the, you know, uh, talking about Hamilton, you know, who lives, who dies, who tells your story. Um, you know, who tells the story is important. And, and I think seeing how it was part of the apparatus of oppression, suppressing the voices that would tell the true story was part of, um, you know, making the history act in their favor. And um, so we're working in the history books to write that wrong. Um, but I think that's why it's so interesting that the National Park Service is getting into it. Because most of us, I think, in this room are out of school, are not going back to school. Um, and so, especially if we learned the wrong history, but probably as it happens, most of us just barely even learned Reconstruction history. Um, mm -hmm. I love that the National Park Service is coming in to do this because we still, well, I hope we, everyone still goes to the parks. I'm sure you hope that too. Yes. Um, yeah. So can you tell me a little bit more about the National Park Service's efforts in this regard? Because I think, you know, I grew up in the West, so I think the National Park Service as Yosemite. Mm -hmm. um, and I think folks who are from the East Coast might think of these, you know, sort of like battlefields. Um, but telling this history is something that I think is really interesting that the Park Service is doing. Can you speak more to that, Mr. Allen? Yes, I can. Um, as Kate shared and Takaya shared, um, the National Park Service, many of you all know, we celebrate our centennial last month. And the question is, how can we be more relevant with today's population? And taking to what both ladies said, how can we ensure that everyone's history is being told? I come at this from a professional perspective and a personal perspective. I was fortunate enough 16 years ago um, in Beaufort, South Carolina, to be a part of a conversation that was led by outgoing Secretary of the Interior, Bruce Babbitt. And he rightfully said that at that point in 2000, there were no National Park Service sites within our system, within our family, that addressed reconstruction. And given, as Takaya said, the history and the breadth and scope of what Beaufort County offered to us as a nation, as, as a country, some serious consideration should be given to Beaufort. Mm -hmm. and, and I believe that sparked a, a 16 year conversation with ebbs and flows, I mind you, um, looking at that community as a potential site for a National Park Service. And there's some benchmark reasons. One, um, in the fall of 1861, November of 1861, as we would say in Gullah, uh, big shoot happened when uh, northern forces came into Port Royal Sound and attacked uh, Confederate soldiers. And, and in fact, that actually transformed the lower part of South Carolina. It, it, it opened up a, a dialogue of freedom and opportunity that had not existed there. And that began the roots and the seeds, if you will, of Reconstruction with fundamental questions. Now, what do we do with these African Americans that are here? Uh, do we still call them slaves? Are they contraband? Do we free them? Do we send them along with their masters who left? Do we pay them? Do we house them? Can they be employed by the military? And so when you look at Beaufort County specifically and the roots and the seeds that, that were born and germinated there, it's important that the National Park Service be a part of this conversation and, and to have dialogue you know, with the community. And one other important fact is that many of these tangible sites that was associated with this transformation from slavery to freedom still exists today. Uh, Congressman Clyburn talked about uh, the Penn Center, and, uh, which was born during Reconstruction. There are many physical structures, buildings, landscapes that are still there, that are still part of this conversation. And so we believe that it's important that some conversation takes place with the community to bring to the American public 
a better awareness, and understanding, and an appreciation, as Kate talked about, about Reconstruction and its relationship to us today in the 21st century. So you're working on uh, doing that through thinking about these sites and the stories through your theme study. Right. Um, what are some of the issues that you have focused on in that endeavor? I'm thinking of, you know, there are big picture questions, but they're also fantastic, colorful stories of the people, the personalities, mm -hmm. the history. I mean, think of Robert Smalls and yeah. the, you know, and, the, and taking the, planter, the Confederate right. ship, and you know, I mean, these are amazing stories. Can you talk about some of those? Bring out some of um, that kind of flavor for us. Well, I think we're looking at what we call the tangibles. Mm -hmm. Today, the home that Robert Smalls grew up in, as enslaved, that he secured as a freeman, still stands in Buford County, in, in the city of Buford today, that, that you can see and touch and, and experience. Um, on January the 1st, 1863, at the Smith Plantation, um, which now is on a naval hospital complex, is where the first reading of the Emancipation Proclamation took place in South Carolina, specifically in the South. That physical landscape is there today. Mitchellville, uh, which is a, a freedman's community established in the latter part of the Civil War on Hilton Head Island. The community is gone, but the landscape and the land of which Mitchellville sits, it's still there. And just not focusing on Buford, but in, in our work and our studies throughout the South, there are landscapes, communities, buildings, facilities, places in which Reconstruction took place. It was a tangible real occurrence, mm -hmm. and our objective is to be able to share that. You know, the three of us recognize that there's one thing that we hear often, and Kate alluded to, that, that Reconstruction, one, did not happen. Mm -hmm. Two, that it was not successful. Three, it should not be discussed. Mm -hmm. and, and four, why should we do it today? Mm -hmm. And I think the three of us as a team realize there is relevancy in that period of time, and our responsibility as an agency is to bring that relevancy to the public. Mm -hmm. And to follow up on that, uh, I wanted to take a broader view of mm -hmm. the conversation that was had in um, 2000 right. with um, former Secretary Babbitt. The Park Service was also starting to begin to plan for our Civil War sesquicentennial, the 150th. And we determined as an agency that we wanted to expand that story beyond the battlefield. Um, which for our 100th anniversary, we focused on troop movements and which general did this when. Um, really focusing on our national park units which were involved in the Civil War, the actual fighting. Um, but years ago, and, and Michael can talk more about this time, a group of National Park Service professionals came together and decided we are going to be bold and state first that the cause of the Civil War was slavery, something the agency had not done um, in our history was to make that connection boldly um, and charge our national park units to begin to interpret that story, to expand that story. Well, history does, the history of this country does not end with the ringing of the bell at Appomattox. What happened after the fighting mm -hmm. stopped? Well, we moved into Reconstruction. So we had to, in order to tell the Civil War story, we had to tell what the impacts were in the aftermath. How did we get to the Civil Rights Movement the 100 years afterward? Um, and so we developed another program called From Slavery to, um, from, from Civil War to Civil Rights, um, where we committed ourselves as an agency to talk about that 100 years to talk about the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment, how that became eroded in this country, and then how we had to recapture our ideal of American citizenship through the 1960s Civil Rights Movement. Um, and so that has been our charge for the last uh, decade, mm -hmm. uh, and it continues with the theme study, uh, which we hope to encourage and support others to begin to commemorate and recognize within their own communities. Um, so what is the theme study? It sounds very um, okay. 
I don't know, you have theme and yeah, study. Right. It's kind of very like abstract. Um, I get the handbook. That makes sense to me. Um, but can you talk more about what you what you mean by when you talk about this theme study? Because it's a, I mean, it's an amazing project that you're talking about. Um, and I think, you know, to help us understand how exactly you're going to make that happen, um, you know, is is fascinating because it, mm -hmm. it seems to me both a project of reinterpretation and establishment mm -hmm. of new historical stories. Mm -hmm. Well, um, so I am a historian in a university who became involved with the National Park Service, and so um, I will kind of I can speak to this sort of from the from the perspective of the person who was one of two people. I should mm -hmm. add that um, my partner in this was Gregory Downs, who's a historian at UC Davis, and he and I um, have all been the two academic historian advisors mm -hmm. on this project all along. So. Um, I'm kind of speaking for both of us here. Uh, we, we were hired to write a theme study. Now, the, the term theme study is a term within the Park Service, and they have done many theme studies. And as I understand it, uh, they'll do a theme study, the Park Service will do a theme study when they basically want to know more about a particular issue. Um, we, were, we read some previous theme studies. There was one on the history of American aviation. There's one on the history of public accommodations mm -hmm. in the civil rights era. Yeah. Um, there's a variety, so it can be kind of all different sorts of um, themes where they want to understand more the parameters of a particular issue in American history, um, and then try to identify where are places where we could be, we the Park Service could be um, interpreting this history. Mm -hmm. And so Greg Downs and I um, put, to, be put together with the help of Mike and Turkaya and other people kind of throughout the service, and actually there was a really big process of gathering information which involved tons of people. Um, it has a couple different parts. It's, right now it's being finalized, for, so you know, it's, it will, it's forthcoming, coming soon. Um, <laughs> it, it, so it, it introduces the era of reconstruction and it gives a kind of up-to-date, essay-like um, kind of framework of here's what reconstruction was and here's why it matters. And uh, we devised in a meeting that we had at the beginning of this project, there, we all collectively came up with six different themes um, that comprise what we consider to be the most, sort of the most important themes in the history of Reconstruction. Mm -hmm. So a large part of the theme study is a kind of overview of those themes, which would be um, familiar to you if you had recently read a legitimate sort of serious treatment of Reconstruction, of which there are many good ones at this point. Mm -hmm. um, and then we go I'm on sure to... I'm sure you all have, right? Yeah. Everyone has. yeah. Uh, and then we go on to... <clears throat> Um, talk about, well, where are some places where this history could be, re mm -hmm. be interpreted? And these kind of places could be places that are already National Park Service sites, mm -hmm. or they could be places that are National Historic Landmarks, or they could be places that should be nominated to become National Historic Landmarks. Mm -hmm. And I, I just want to give an example, because I, this is one just to kind of throw out there. There were a lot of things that I thought were very interesting, and also coming at it as an academic historian who we don't usually always think about place. We don't so when we think about something significant that happened, we don't necessarily think, well, is the building still there or not? It doesn't matter that much in a certain context. But in this context, it matters very, very much. Mm -hmm. So there are categories of uh, kind of uh, integrity of the building, integrity of the site that matter a lot for this. But so to give an example, Beale Street in Memphis is a National Historic Landmark, mm -hmm. yeah. it is. The, and it's a historic district. Now, why is it designated a historic district? Because of music. Because of the history of music, it is tied to African American history. Um, it's tied to having had a significant black business district there, mm -hmm. but is not tied to Reconstruction in the way that it is understood as a national historic landmark. But it turns out that the community around Beale Street in the era of Reconstruction, you know, which is part of the reason became Beale, the Beale Street that we know, was a highly significant African American community coming out of slavery, where some of the most important black churches in Memphis were, where some of the major black business leaders of the Reconstruction era were. And so that's an example, there, there are many different kinds of examples, but that's an example of a place that's known already to be historically significant, but not known in the way that we could know it mm -hmm. if we frame things more around Reconstruction. Mm -hmm. and, and I would add with that, um, as we've gone through this process, it has caused us as an agency to examine our own maybe previous decisions mm -hmm. in how we may have accepted National Register nominations, National Historic Landmark nominations, mm -hmm. and what was hidden in plain view that was not added to the document. Mm -hmm. 
And so I think there's a validation now that will come as a result of this process mm -hmm. where we will look more intensely mm -hmm. at the work that we're receiving from the communities and ensuring that everyone's history will be a part of this conversation. Mm -hmm. And to follow up on, on Mike's point, um, one of the early uh, projects with doing the handbook and the theme study was to identify existing national park units that have a reconstruction story that is already being interpreted or where we could um, expand the story to tell those stories. Um, many of you may not know that national park units are designated um, by Congress or by the president um, for a specific historic significance. Um, and oftentimes, as Kate was um, pointing out, that significance is not one that covers the totality of why a site is important. Mm -hmm. um, but we have the opportunity through theme studies mm -hmm. to um, learn new information that we did not know and to take the opportunity to redevelop our interpretation to tell those stories. So we have stories um, that can be told at um, Andrew Johnson's site. We have stories that can be told at Jean Lafitte. They are actually a um, preserve, as well as they manage the jazz, New Orleans jazz site, but that's also the site of Plessy v. Ferguson. So we work hard to interpret that story at Jean Lafitte and New Orleans Jazz. Um, we also have uh, uh, Natchez National Historical Park, uh, which has a strong reconstruction story. Uh, the majority of um, the number of senators and congressmen, African Americans that are um, elected from Mississippi are the largest numbers up outside of South Carolina, I believe, mm -hmm. um, uh, to come from that state. So our Natchez site also interprets reconstruction stories. Um, I also want to point out there is a National Historic Landmark just about six blocks up the Blanche K. Bruce House um, that was designated years ago um, that tells the story of Senator Blanche K. Bruce, one of our Reconstruction, African American Reconstruction senators. So you could even walk up, uh, walk up Seventh, uh, about two blocks over from the convention center, and see a National Historic Landmark, which the theme study helps us to identify these sites so that we can begin to recognize them. So uh, before we get to questions, I want to make sure that we talk about relevance to 2016. Um, but before we get there, hearing you talk about this, and especially I was thinking when you mentioned Andrew Johnson, um, a lot of this um, sometimes is about adding to existing things, you know, adding to mm -hmm. Beale Street, adding its historical significance. But a lot of, I mean, you think Andrew Johnson, a lot of that is uh, contesting mm -hmm. history and what is the important part of that story to tell. So if you're Right now, while you have the theme study um, mm -hmm. in process, but that's a little more academic. Let's say I'm you know, just a member of the public coming to one of these sites mm -hmm. that raises the themes that you look at. How am I going to experience that retelling of history, the kind of opening up the story, particularly in these existing sites? I think in some sense, it's almost easier if you're creating something new, mm -hmm. but when you have this contested history, how do I, as the public, member of the public coming to these National Park Service sites, experience that? Well, I think the work that both, all three of us are describing here provides the opportunity, first of all, for the park itself to recognize that there's a history that needs to be told, mm -hmm. first of all. And with that, as we disseminate this information, you, the traveling public, now come looking for it. I would say in, in my 36 years with the National Park Service, there have been times perhaps where the public may have been ahead of us because they, rec they recognize the importance and the relevancy of what we perhaps were not telling. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and in some way, they informed us of this. And so this process here gives us the opportunity to inform our fellow compatriots, if you will, in the Park Service, mm -hmm. that there is a broader story, there's a history that's there. Mm -hmm. Especially when it, it, it can become personal or someone's uh, family or lineage 
and that particular place is not interpreting it, or is not even looking at it, or is not even having a conversation about it. So I, we realize, again, I, I guess I came up with a phrase, we are reconstructing reconstruction. Mm. And, and in reconstructing it, it's done not to be subversive, but to tell a full story. Mm -hmm. and, that, and I think that's a core part of our mission as an agency. Mm -hmm. I mean, <clears throat> the reality is that if you tell the whole story, I mean, ev people will come with their own views and you yeah. know, lots of people have different kinds of mm -hmm. expectations or reactions, but if you tell the whole story uh, and you think about it from a, from a kind of political history and a social history perspective, um, you know, you could say there are three major themes. One is a theme of emancipation, African American empowerment, community building, a lot of themes that many of us would see as uplifting, uh, the emergence of a new, better form of democracy in the United States. Another theme would be, especially if you're talking to lawyers, uh, mm -hmm. the changing shape of the federal government, right? Mm -hmm. So the kind of, the theme of the constitutional amendments and what becomes possible, how the system of federalism is transformed. And another theme is adamant white resistance to what's happening. And um, a unwillingness, um, an unwillingness among many white Southerners to uh, cooperate with federal law, um, a resorting to corruption in the ballot, uh, in voting, and also terrorist violence. And um, if you really are going to put all of that out on the table, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What you're inviting is a serious conversation mm -hmm. with some of, about some of the most significant mm -hmm. issues in American history. I mean, mm -hmm. that continue to resonate mm -hmm. with us now. And right. so that's one of the reasons that this has been a hard period to bring mm -hmm. forward in public history. Mm -hmm. But it's also one of the reasons that I think many of us are very committed to doing this mm -hmm. for exactly that reason. Mm -hmm. That, that's a, I, I think that's a very powerful point because as, as you mentioned, you know, particularly um, uh, with such fresh history, you have families, you know, you have grandparents, great grandparents. This is not, you know, our, our country is a young country, but this is still uh, fresh history. And, and I think that's, you know, having these difficult conversations, um, which sometimes can be difficult, I think, um, is what's so interesting about what you all in the Park Service are trying to do because um, I think a lot of times families come to uh, parks in some ways to have these conversations. It's you know a way of making it um, not quite so personal mm -hmm. um, and yet very personal because you're standing there in, in the place. Mm -hmm. um, so can you talk a little bit about how you envision when someone comes, you know, after you've Publish the theme study after you've you know come up with these new uh, you know stories that you want to tell. How you want them to experience it as a person in 2016, or you know I know how the government works, maybe it won't come up 2017, um, <laughs> but you know that's okay. Yeah. Um, how you want them to experience it because I think there are a lot of conversations when we talk about yeah. reconstruction, just those yeah. themes that you mentioned, you know, economic inequality. Um, uh, state violence against communities of color, looking for protection, um, and perhaps instead of finding protection, finding violence. Um, issues of economic and educational opportunity. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of these issues, and, and you know, all the way up to you know, very uh, hot conversations about reparations and mm -hmm. truth and reconciliation. So there are a lot of current issues that I think can really um, be informed by the context of Reconstruction. So you, as a 2016, 2017 <laughs> visitor, yeah. how do you see that person experiencing this and learning from it and putting it in today's relevancy? Well, first, I would say visitors come to our park units for a multitude of reasons. Um, we have Kennesaw Mountain Battlefield, which is in Metro Atlanta. And it is one of our Civil War sites. But most of the visitors come to run. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a recreational park. So there are times where visitors will come and not have any interaction or engagement with the historical significance mm -hmm. of the park. And we have to be open for, to that. Um, I want the visitor to come to our national park units and know that we are a safe space and a brave space meaning that those multiple perspectives mm -hmm. um, 
those visitors that come with multiple purposes and perspectives will be able to vo voice those perspectives, but we are charged with giving them the historical evidence, the facts, and facilitating dialogue and conversation, but as an agency, being um, very clear about where the historical evidence leads us, and that's why we do we do the theme studies in order to make sure, yes, we have the best research, mm -hmm. um, the best information to present to our visitor, but how they interpret that, how they engage with that, the experiences that uh, Congressman Cl Clyburn talked about um, leads them to that conversation. But we want them, I personally want them to come, engage with the information, talk to us, engage with the park rangers, um, historians, and um, come away a little bit more educated, more civically engaged, mm -hmm. and more committed to stewardship of the places mm -hmm. that we're preserving. I think there's another element here. I've seen in my journey with the Park Service, when, when folks are coming to, to our sites, as Takai says, not just to run, but it's for healing. It's for restoration. It's for answers. It's for understanding. And I, I know the challenges that Reconstruction faces in terms of how we interpret it. But for many families, these questions have to be answered. Mm -hmm. And I believe that the work that we are embarked on and the work that the agency is engaged in provides us this opportunity. I mean, we're seen by many Americans as a place where people can come and feel safe and leave with some understanding of our American experience. Mm -hmm. And we should not allow a, a period of time to dictate us where we don't go where we should go. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So speaking of going where we should go, I think it's now our time to go to the questions. So we'd love to hear um, what you guys want to talk about in this discussion. You come to the microphones uh, in the aisles on the side. Um, I do yes, have sir. a question, but if I may, I have a comment first. I, I agree that uh, Reconstruction is one of the most difficult periods to understand mm -hmm. and to try to teach to someone. It's, it's, there are so many nuances to it that it's very difficult. Um, uh, one of the things that I have learned is that, of course, uh, about relevancy, if you can somehow draw a connection between the past and today, mm -hmm. uh, people are much more likely to be interested in it and understand it. And I've given a few presentations on Reconstruction, and I always lead off with showing newspaper headlines from the Reconstruction era, but also from the 21st century. Mm -hmm. They deal with the issues of voting rights, they deal with racial violence, they deal with you know who's a citizen. And I throw these uh, headlines up without the dates, and I ask people to tell me, are these Reconstruction era headlines, or are they today's headlines? And they realize that they're from both. Uh, then they're much more interested. Plus, it's it's just people who are looking at today's issues really need to have that understanding and background of uh, uh, of what happened, you know, 100, 150 years ago, to fully understand it. Uh, and I want to make one more comment about uh, historic sites. You mentioned the uh, Blanche K. Bruce House. Uh, we've been doing work. Uh, I work for the Park Service also. We've been doing work here in the D.C. area on historic sites following uh, Dakaya's low, uh, and, and uh, Michael's lead. Uh, and in addition to sites like that, we've discovered new sites. For example, in Georgetown, there's the house of the first African-American public teacher in Washington, D.C., one of the first public teachers anywhere, African-American. And that is a very significant site for students to learn about and, and maybe to, to see and if we can somehow figure out how to interpret the house. Uh, my question is, uh, have you gotten any feedback from frontline park service interpreters who've been able to talk about reconstruction? What have their experiences been? Have they been able to get their messages across to visitors and what have the comments been like coming back? That is a great question. Yeah. I would say that we have from, from a few I think, as a whole, this is still new to us mm -hmm. as, as an agency, because I know you and I know um, your thrust and your support of it. 
they are some that I think that are ready to meet this challenge and some are hesitant because they're unsure what the challenge will bring us. This reminds me of Rally on the High Ground almost a decade ago when, as Takaya shared, you know, this, this statement that slavery was one of, is, is a central tenet of the Civil War mm -hmm. and, and, and how that affected us as an agency. Mm. You know, our coworker may have seen things a little bit different than what was being directed by the Washington office. Mm. So I, I think we're in a building stage. I think the handbook moves us in the direction of having the conversations that we would need to have. Once the theme study is finished and that's been disseminated out, uh, that provides a, another opportunity for us as an agency to also, because we have to prepare ourselves as an agency before we go and invite the public. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that can be challenging. And so it, it's my hope that, that we can use the tools that we're developing here, keep Kate and Greg forever, <laughs> <laughs> and they can help right. us. Um, so speaking of the handbook, can you say a little bit more about that? Because that's, and th is this it right here? Yeah. 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 Um, this is mine now. Yeah. <laughs> so that's out. Mine's in the green. Yeah. <laughs> this is the, so the theme study is, is still being reviewed, and, and it's, I don't know if it's going to look as nice and glossy as this, but I, we, it yes. will. Okay. Yes. So I, we are so proud of this. I am really proud of this, and uh, I guess it's, well, it's the Reconstruction Era uh, Official National Park Service Handbook, and you can buy it online mm -hmm. through park service sites. on parks or in park service sites. It's for it's about ten dollars, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. um, and so what it so this already exists, and it's a comp compilation of essays by leading historians of the Reconstruction era, including people that you may have heard of, like Eric Foner, yeah. David Blight, the Tavolia Glimpse, Heather Williams, um, and many others. Brooke mm -hmm. Simpson. Um, and it is, th they're thematic essays, they're not very long, and then it's beautifully illustrated throughout. And it is intended for multiple audiences, both for people who might pick, buy one at a park service site as a kind of primer um, mm -hmm. on the Reconstruction Era. It's modeled after a couple of other handbooks that the park service had already done, including a really great one on the Civil War itself that came out with the sesquicentennial. Um, it's also sort of geared toward people within the park service as a way of getting up to mm -hmm. speed on uh, current interpretations, again, about a period that many people have misperceptions about or otherwise just feel very flummoxed by, mm -hmm. right? Feel very kind of, in it is intimidating mm -hmm. um, in some ways. It feels very complicated, uh, even though I think part of that is us, not actually Reconstruction. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, so, so this is, uh, this. so the, the Park Service, I mean, sorry, the handbook is this, the theme study is something different, mm -hmm. but yeah. this exists. And, and to follow up yeah. on that, um, the handbook is often used by our interpreters to get a general overview of the history. So I talked about how some of our national park units have reconstruction stories, but they don't necessarily know mm -hmm. what those are. And so they'll use the handbook to get up to speed, as Kate was saying, so that they can engage with the public, the visitors who come mm -hmm. for that reconstruction story. Mm -hmm. I also would like to put a plug the theme, store, the theme study is not the end. Mm -hmm. It is just our first effort to begin to identify places that we can then pursue as national historic landmarks. I would encourage you to please help us to identify sites. We are um, looking for your recommendations. We've sent out uh, emails and various announcements asking for those who may know of a site that may be nationally significant um, to send those to us so that we can, we can compile a list. Um, most National Historic Landmark nominations are prepared by the public by the general public. They're not prepared by the National Park Service. We don't have the capacity um, to recognize those sites. And we have um, a little bit over 2,500 National Historic Landmarks uh, in the United States. So we are also looking for you to partner with us, communities to partner with us to identify the sites, but also to prepare the nominations so that we can begin to recognize these sites. Without your engagement, the theme study will be a completion, but it will not be a success. Wow, so the 100th anniversary slogan of the National Park Service, find your park. Mm -hmm. You can create your landmark. <laughs> yes, that's pretty good. Um, yes, sir. 
Hello. Um, my name is Matt Penrod. I'm fortunate, I think thrilled to be one of those frontline park rangers who deal with this subject matter. I work up at Arlington House, the Robert E. Lee Memorial, mm -hmm. and we deal with not only the themes of reconstruction from the African American perspective, but from the white Southern perspective and how all of that was commemorated by the end of the century and how the house became a national memorial to honor General Lee. So it's, it's pretty thrilling and I've found a lot of a lot of experience, most people seem very open and willing to, to talk about these things. They, they, they find great meaning in them. And, um, and so this is very relevant to today as well. And I, I wanted to ask your thoughts on how can the Park Service tie itself into modern social activism? I've, I've listened to Dr. Well, Reverend Barber, the great minister and social activist speak dynamic speaker. If you've never heard him, by all means, look him up online. If you have ever had a chance to see him personally, he's brilliant. But he wrote a book called The Third Reconstruction. Mm -hmm. And he defined, we've gone through two different periods of reconstruction. The first you identify, as you say, ending, ending with uh, Plessy versus Ferguson. Okay. And then the second, beginning really with Brown versus Board of Education, ending with the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King, uh, Jr. But he says we are now currently living in the third reconstruction. Hmm. And so everything that's going on around us today in regards to everything from Black Lives Matter to you know, the fight for voting rights and other things after the repeal of the Voting Rights Act, things of that nature, that right now is the perfect time perhaps to be speaking about all this. So how best can the National Park Service engage in this, kind of find a way of reaching into this, this, you know, grabbing hold of this kind of electrical current that's going through the nation right now and using that to vitalize the message we're trying to, to promote. Well, you know, ironically, um, events of our nation has moved the Park Service to do as you just ask, as you, you know, after Ferguson, the, the folks at the Arch, open up their doors to become an educational opportunity, a, a, a healing opportunity, a, a relevancy of trying to understand th that, that experience in Ferguson in the context of what happened in St. Louis historically. Mm -hmm. And so that's just one example. Um, I, I, I'm from Charleston, South Carolina. L nearly a year ago, the tragic events of, of Mother Emanuel uh, took place less than four blocks uh, from a, a, a park service site, uh, the main departure site to Fort Sumter. Because the proximity of, 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 the, of the distance there, we were drawn into the conversation, especially when they, there was conversations about the Confederate flag mm -hmm. and, and, and flags that had flown at Fort Sumter since, the, since I guess, the early 70s and the configuration that they were. And, and the decision that we as an agency made to, to remove those flags and, and to examine what books we were selling, um, what t-shirts we had, what trinkets that, that, that were on display. And so whether we wanted to or not, we were pulled in this. And, and from a personal perspective, and some of you in this audience know of this, the perpetrator of the crime at Mother Emanuel, because he understood history, he went out and visited historic sites across the state of South Carolina. And he specifically came to a National Park Service site. He came to Fort Moultrie on Sullivan's Island. He left a photographic diary indicating that he was there. And, and he stood adjacent to a sign by our park property that was placed there and dedicated in 1999 because I was there as a part of the program that talked about the arrival of Africans into the harbor of Charleston. But he was not standing by that sign for that specific reason. And, and when I saw that image of him standing adjacent to that sign, and I knew why that sign was there, mm -hmm. I made it my business that I informed the head of the National Park Service mm -hmm. that this is what is happening here. Mm -hmm. We can no longer be on the sideline. And many other things came as a result of that. And so I think sometimes it depends on the leadership, the management, the staff, 
or the community that allows us as an agency to, to find ourselves in these relevant conversations. So as we learn more about reconstruction and, and, and through our handbook and through the theme study and other things we would bring to bear, hopefully that would give us the impetus to, to be more involved as an agency in our current national movement and dialogue. Yes, sir. Hi, I had a question in regard to um, if you, if you're, you, you frame uh, reconstruction around the time period up to uh, 1898 within there, there's some very interesting things that are starting to happen in the western part of the United States. Um, so if you, if you look broadly speaking, so the United States is f highly focused on what's happened in the South mm -hmm. and how they're recovering from that. And much of the South has started to look to the West as a place to kind of mo remove itself mm -hmm. from the issues that have taken place there. At the same time, there are already people there. There are you know, Mexicans, Native Americans, then there's a huge Chinese community that comes in. And the same things that had occurred in the South start to show up in other mm -hmm. places. Mm -hmm and start to repeat themselves. And we see this happen over and over and again. It's, you know, the time for period in which you all give for recon the end of Reconstruction, the uh, Immigration Act of 1882 occurs. Mm -hmm. um, the state of California basically bans Chinese from being able to live there and reproduce and, and, and to even be buried there. Mm -hmm. um, there are all these things that are starting to take place in all these different places. And it's an issue of the United States culture, not the United States government, I'm not going to say, but the United States culture manifesting itself um, in very similar ways in, in different places out throughout the United States. How do you all see this conversation you're having about reconstruction spreading west of the Mississippi, spread into those areas? I know, Ms. Mazur, you've had this conversation before. I actually heard you at OAH. Oh, so I'm, 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 in, I'm interested to hear now that you're kind of near the end of the theme study, I know what that kind of means for you know historians and scholars as they get towards the end of that and they start to look for that next thing. It's like, but how do we? I mean, yeah. a couple of people have mentioned the idea of knitting the story together. That this is mm -hmm. that it in and of itself is not an end right. reconstruction, and is not it doesn't take place within a vacuum. Right. So. I mean, these are great questions, and and I'll just kind of con give a little more context to that to say that in. Uh, yeah, I don't know, in academic history circles, people are talking a lot about the relationship between this kind of more familiar story of Reconstruction and what's going on in the West, particularly Plains Indian Wars, and mm -hmm. how a lot of the army actually, after leaving the South, ends up in Indian Wars and kind of, over the period of a couple of decades, finally defeating a bunch of the uh, main groups of Plains Indians that had been kind of holding out against white settlement. and so. This is, if, on a national level, this be, could be considered, and also in a comparative global perspective, a period of national consolidation, right? That the defeat of the Confederacy and the kind of uh, growth of federal power in Reconstruction is also can be identified with the, the defeat of the Plains Indians, with kind of new borders around the nation, Chinese exclusion. Um, and so there is absolutely you know, good reason to think um, broadly like that. But for the purposes of our study, which is probably what you already heard me say, um, we collectively made a decision several years ago that uh, it was kind of enough to try to tackle <laughs> the more familiar yeah. story yeah. of Reconstruction as we know it to be a kind of Southern you know, issue. And I mean, also arguments can be made for a sort of Northern Reconstruction, right? And the passage of um, civil, basically civil rights activism in the North gets very uh, kind of heated up uh, in the Civil War and after the Civil War, there are state-based civil rights legislation um, during the 1870s and 1880s. In fact, after the Supreme Court overturns the Civil Rights Act of 1875, all these northern states pass their own state civil rights laws, which, by the way, most southern states do not. So when people talk about how uh, the North and South were sort of equally racist, sometimes people like to say that. I, I think there are actually some very <laughs> discernible differences there. Um, Anyway, all that is to, you know, saying, so the, for, for our purposes and for the theme study and for the hand, well, actually, the handbook has an essay on Reconstruction yeah. in the North, an essay on the West. Um, but the theme study is focused on the South, and this kind of process of trying to identify mm -hmm. sites is focused on the South. So um, that's just because of the limitations of time. But, but for sure, you know, this is a conversation that can go on and go mm -hmm. in different places. And, and to follow up on that, this conversation is continuing. Um, there is a project in the works right now to do a historic context, which is an additional um, examination of reconstruction in the Northeast region. So that's already 
starting up, actually. Um, we also have plans to, to move forward with looking at reconstruction writ large, not just the program of reconstruction, mm -hmm. um, to look at those issues because we do know um, that other nationally significant um, um, trends come out of uh, the reconstruction period related to uh, the African American story. So speaking of limitations of time, we have time for one last question uh, and a quick answer before we have to say goodnight. Yes, sir. First, I just wanted to say thank you. Uh, as someone who grew up in Charlottesville, Virginia, where Reconstruction got less than a page in the history book, and it was basically a Dunning School summary, uh, we really wow. appreciate mm -hmm. the effort. Uh, I think this is incredibly important. Um, two quick questions. Uh, one uh, topic that's gotten a lot of attention, uh, particularly over the last six months, has been uh, Brian Stevenson's efforts at a possible memorial to lynching and whether there's been any conversation with the National Park System about that effort. Um, and second, uh, it's a little bit outside the 14th Amendment context, but I lived in Sierra Leone for a couple years in West Africa and on the island where the largest number of slaves took their last steps, uh, there's nothing. Uh, does the National Park Service, has there been ever, any talk of branching outside the U.S. and connecting with uh, countries that are on the other side of, of some of the story? Good question. To the, your latter question, um, in the late 1990s, there was a foray, if you will, um, by the National Park Service with Bunce Island mm -hmm. and the government of Sierra Leone just for the reason that you asked, because of the connectivity. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, through a series of civil wars and other things have transpired, um, I don't think that continued. Uh, in South Carolina, that effort has continued uh, through a document that you can see, family across the sea, mm -hmm. yeah. which chronicles um, Gullah Geechee people uh, from the coastal area of South Carolina, Georgia, Florida, actually going and meeting family members, if you will, in Sierra Leone. And then that was followed up eventually with another documentary called The Language That You Cry In, which also chronicles that there was a, a, a Mindy song that had been passed down generationally. And the family lives um, outside of Brunswick, Georgia. Mm -hmm. the, Amelia Dolly was her name, and I know her grandson. And, and they would sing the song, but not knowing the origin of it. And a number of historians was able to trace that into Sierra Leone and, and in Joe Apollo. And, and in that document, the language you cry in, that's chronicle that relationship. So hopefully this is something that can work through, as Congressman Clyburn did indicate it, the Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage Corridor, which exists now today, um, a part of their mission is just not looking on this side of the Atlantic, but also on the other side of the Atlantic. So there's some opportunities to, to address that from that perspective. And to your first question, I have not been engaged with Mr. Stevenson and yeah. his efforts. I'm, I'm not aware of anything, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. any official partnership or conversation. Mm -hmm. Well, the work continues, I'm sure, and uh, our conversation could continue for hours and hours, but I know the good people at the National Archives have a, have a time limit for us, alas. But I was so delighted by this conversation, and I feel like it's, you know, as you said with the theme study, it's just starting. So um, thank you so much for being here with us tonight. Please join me thank in you. thanking our wonderful thank panel. Thank you, guys. For coming out. <laughs> and thanks to all of you for coming, and thank you for watching at home. Thank you. <laughs>